convenience store in the United States, so I think most people assume Saturday, things left are not one thing. April 16th. You know? But it. Hmm. I love that meme. No, I think you're right. You but I think that's also a sad change. In the, in our. Recently? Because I think in the old days, you leave something in a store, it would be there in the last Today, day. Saturday. But here, now, you leave something, it might disappear into the pocket. Testing. Today is. Somebody in the store. I'll test it. Go I ahead. Hear. Thank you. Okay. Well, like, I left something in the, the supermarket, like the petroleum. And somebody just took something out of my trolley. <laughs> out of your what? I guess like it was close to them to take it from my trolley then. Oh, you mean they took like a grocery item yeah, from your yeah. from your cart? In Australia or here? Uh, here. They took it out of your cart? Yeah. Before I, or after you paid for it? No, before. Like they didn't steal it, but it's kind of like like it's weird. closer than me walking ten People miles. Gonna walk walk That's walk weird. To I'm not Although I, I have to say on the other side, that twice or three times, I, there was a period where I was leaving my yeah, wallet in my in the cart. I had I was only That's carrying a, like a, a woman's wallet, which is like an oblong zipper container, you know, zipper thing. So it, it doesn't have a handle. It's not big. It's not a purse. And put into the front of the cart, you don't see it very well, especially in the parking lot, which was dark. So I left it there. And twice or three times, the people found it, returned it to Trader Joe's, and I got it back. Nice. Even though it had credit cards and money and driver's license and all that stuff in it. So there's upside downside kind of thing. But you're, he's saying in Australia it's a little bit more trustworthy than here. It used to be in Japan, you could leave your bicycle somewhere and nobody would touch it ever. You didn't have to lock it. You just you would just like walk away from it in front of a store, come back four hours later, it'd still be there. But here, kind of I don't know. This is Jawson's. They, okay. I, I hear not only it, not only will they take your bicycle, if your bicycle is locked up and your front tire is locked up, they may take your seat in order to sell it for drug money. <laughs> okay, well, we're recording now, so all that previous yeah. conversation was on tape, so... Oh my god! I'm <coughs> so regretful! Not. Yeah, that's me. Sorry. Well, what, you, what, you, what, are, what are you into? What am I into? Yeah, it looks like you're busy at work in a book. Oh, actually, I was just finding a blank page and going through oh. years of uh, like drawing out the elements of theology. So I was like, wow, I did a lot of work on that. That's pretty much what I was discovering. Yeah. Uh, what do you find in, in uh, that Proclus's commentary on the Euclid? On what do I find? <coughs> yeah. I was how, how far are you into it? Uh, I don't. I have only really read the prologue probably five times, oh. and certain parts of it, because I'm not so interested in the seven different ways to prove a proof, and I kind of just pick and choose sections of it. So <coughs> the real thing that influenced me is the prologue, like, because that's where he kind of goes into what he thinks mathematics is. And so. Uh should we wait until he gets into the propositions before we ask him anything? I think he has gotten into the propositions, though he maybe has? not the commentary. Yes, that would be because he studied with our friend the the wall bank. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Uh, what do you make of the fourth proposition? Other than what we've made of it for ten years, <laughs> fifteen, twenty years now. Uh, well, it's key and essential. Without it, you can't go onward from that, and it's also a violation of the principles of his... It's also a violation yeah. of the principles. Of the postulates and the common notions and the definitions. It doesn't appear in any of the fundamental framework. But, it, but it, he calls the fourth proposition the first one. Oh, well, yes, it is. Right? It is, because the first three are actually doings. They're not really proofs. It's like, do this. It's kind of like a... Constructions. Yeah, they're, they're tools. I mean, what does it mean if that's true? I assume it's true. If the fourth one is the first proposition? And, and that the establishes the idea of proof. It's the first proof. The others are... 
uh, not propositions. They're descriptions of, of properties of physical objects or ideal objects like triangles. Okay, so, so that's the first one. That's reasoning coming uh -huh. to a conclusion. Right. And you have a you perceive a weakness. I uh, I understand. Yes. In the very foundation of the fourth proposition, which is the first reasoning proposition in Euclid. Yeah. What did that do to you? Um, and, and what, pardon me, what does it hinge upon, this fundamental lack? What does the lack hinge upon? Well, you mean the technical lack? Is that what you mean? That, I'll take that. Oh, well, a few things that you could pick something up in two-dimensional space and place it on another and just say, well, they have to match each other because of their their same measurements. That's all he essentially does. Yeah, that's he deals with that, doesn't he, by one word, coincide. Yeah, things which coincide with one another are equal to right. one another. Right. And so... And you see there's a fundamental weakness in the very first proposition, mm -hmm. proposition that he reasons and therefore his reasoning that establishes geometry is fundamentally weak. Yeah, as beautiful as it is, you know, at the same time. So he asked me what it does to me. Uh, at once, it does nothing to me because I just keep, the reasoning still follows from itself after that. So, and you can follow all the rest of the reasoning and still agree to it and see the beauty of what he does and at the same time it kind of raises a mystery to me about an intellectual system that you have to somehow go beyond it to actually you know like there's a mystery laid in that like it is a weakness but at the same time it's kind of like a, a wake-up call to like that you have to get outside of the system you're in to actually see the truth of it, like... You mean, in order to have a rational system, the first premise and the first demonstration and the first rational exploration of an idea you accept is going to be fundamental weak if it follows Euclid. <laughs> and there's no way to avoid that weakness, but nonetheless, we go on ahead from there and build great systems. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. As with many mathematics, somehow that seems to occur. Like, even with that, somehow there's still mathematical principles that describe the path of my pen as it travels through the air. You know, like, and even though it does break down on like a chaos level of mathematics, it still works to some extent, which is like incredible. It's incredible that something that is not rational can produce a quasi-rational system that has vast applications as well as theoretically constructing rational systems, but they all rest upon a fundamental weakness inherent in the system. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. See, See with the that's, word weakness... Th I'm that's that's Gödel's proof. <laughs> Essentially, that's Gödel's proof. And I think in one sense, Euclid being such an amazing person knew that. Yeah. Like, I, I would almost say, like, by putting that, he didn't need, actually, he did need to put that at number four to do number five. Uh, but he probably could have got around that system, systematically. I think he was aware of that. Like, oh. So why don't you tell us the discussion you and Broad had on this one for what we've already covered so far. Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how did he deal with that fundamental problem? I don't think he actually... Like, did it disturb him? Did it... And I have a reason for asking this, by the way. I, I mean, I would turn to my fellow students of his at the same time, but I don't remember. Maybe they could say something in their experience, but I don't remember it really disturbing him. Or becoming something you know, that to... To get help, you know. ...ruminate on. You also know that there are other students of Roger Wallbank here among us. Yes. <laughs> no. Roderick Wallbank, <clears throat> not Roger. <laughs> <laughs> How did he deal with one four? Uh, I don't remember that he uh, made an issue of it either. Um, I'm kind of surprised, though, that 
um, that the take that you have on I mean, at the take you have on it that is kind of surprising to me that and that's uh, that is the conclusion of girdle girdle's proof that systems are either complete or consistent right but not both but not both mm -hmm. they can't be they're either incomplete and consistent or inconsistent and complete right yeah, right right <laughs> so but it surprises you well it surprises me that you therefore like you don't say whoa well two things surprise me so the, i'll give you the lesser first the lesser is that i don't know that he could have gotten a workaround to one four did you ever make that chart that showed mm -hmm. the dependency like oh yeah mm -hmm. i don't know if all the proofs go from one four one five Mm -hmm. You know, how are you going to get a workaround and not have the flaw in the system? I wouldn't think you could. But well, in the okay. end, in the end, I think he, that he would have to put it somewhere. I'm saying I think he put it first on purpose. Like the fifth, the fifth proposition is about proving I saw the angles and isosceles triangles are congruent to one another if the sides are equal. And he does use number four. I imagine there are other ways of proving that same thing about an isosceles triangle that wouldn't need one for, but I would have to, to work that well, out. Well, that you could do one proof without one for, the, as, as I said, it seems to me kind of difficult to consider that you might be able to structure a whole system without one, you know, sequentially, step by step without one for. Yeah, you might be able to do one five. What about one six, one seven, one eight, one nine, one ten, one eleven, you know, mm -hmm. all the way up. Second, um, that, that it seemed like you concluded that <clears throat> that it was essential function of no knowing of knowledge that it should <clears throat> be, have this flaw. Oh, I don't know if I went if I said that about knowing. Well, th no. there wasn't anything beyond such systems, so that's that's what I interpreted as. Therefore, that I that there's nothing beyond this rational. This flaws. Quasi rational system? Quasi rational, yeah, with flaws. Yeah. I um, think he said that mathematics is the systems, and he recognized there were flaws, but there are a numerous manif manif manifestations of, of them. True. But that doesn't get around this, what I was pointing out, which is if I they. I don't are, think I agree to that. Okay, no, good. I no, no, I, I'm, so. I'm fine. No, yeah, yeah. I, that's why, you know, please express your point of view because I'd rather you didn't have that since I found it rather shocking. No, that, so, that any of these intellectual systems based upon fundamental principles and that work, work out a rational system around that have s something that you need to go beyond in order to actually understand them. See, that's the, that's like, the curious, so gotcha. that's the that's the one for, beyond in the sense of not contained within the system. Yeah. Which we were calling a flaw, right? Yes. Yeah, you, you wanted to change the vocabulary on that. Well, right. I, I, it is a flaw, and I see that in terms of when you judge it as a system, but I see it as something actually more fundamental in terms of being a learner. Like see, that's what I find shocking. That very thing. That's right. Because? Um, because you're setting yourself up for, to proceed within systems that are flawed. I mean, you're going to, I don't no. know how to put no. that. No. Let, let me see, try something. Essentially, he has two triangles by all ways of reasoning bear an exact identity one to the other. Right. And he has now a problem. <clears throat> Just because they are equal in all of these respects, how can you possibly say that they're one? Or identical or yeah. same, right? Uh -huh. Sameness of measure. And this, let me change it. Okay. In a system of two-dimensional thought, there will always be a fundamental weakness within the reasoning among two-dimensional thinking, which always presupposes a higher principle, the third, mm -hmm. in order for it to be rational. If this is so, is it equally true that third dimensional thinking equally has a fundamental flaw that can only be considered purely rational by assuming a fourth dimension? 
I would say it's likely. I don't. I haven't seen a proof for that, but I don't, I don't don't there there can't be a proof for that. Okay, let me change that. I haven't seen something interesting because then it would have to go beyond the fourth dimension. Right. Okay. So there's these regressions, regressions to prior dimensions. Yeah. Um. Oh. See, that's why 1-4 is so central. Proclus doesn't deal with it. He says, uh, <laughs> they coincide, forget it. Yeah. No, no, no. It's a principle that if you're dealing with an intellectual system in any, in any dimension that presupposes principles consistent with that dimension, you'll always find a fundamental flaw within it if you're going to try to create a rational system in and out of it. That's going to require you to assume a higher dimension in order to give it coherence, necessary coherence. Mm -hmm. See, what's lovely about that, is it true when he gets into solid geometry? Who, Proclus or Euclid or Proclus? Euclid. I well, haven't read those actually, oh. so I don't know. Oh, okay. Hmm. I don't know either, unfortunately. We ought to do that. What about you, Pierre? Do you know? <laughs> I know, that's the one problem. Yeah. You can move your chair forward, though. I don't mind. Yeah. Yeah, you can yeah, be, be careful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll end up bushwhacking. So. Well, whacking bushes. See, that's a third dimension creating a problem. <laughs> and to get out of the problem, you move the chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. well, I mean, he had to see that there had to be a way to get out of that. He got a good one, too. He found a good one. Right? Yeah. yeah. Which is out of the third dimension. Yeah. Well, right. well, that's the question, see? Is that kind of thinking? A higher dimension than the three dimensions of which remembers. Right. See that? Came in the perfect timing. Huh? Good question. Maybe Yanni can tell us since he did it. <laughs> see, see, the question that goes to it is it true that there is no way of verifying? when there are two sets of ideas that are similar, that they're equivalent. Hmm. Okay, let me change that, okay? That's this a could subject. be called the problem of the first hypothesis in self, yeah. couldn't it? No, Sorry, no. go ahead. Well, see, what is an analogy? What does that similar mean? Hmm. Right? A is to be as, which is similar. A is to be is similar to, C is to D. Right? Uh, suppose someone came along and said, look, uh, I got news for you. There's no way you can establish that that's true. Hmm. Really? And, and they would say because there's no reason you can establish they are similar because? Well, if a ruler is to his subjects as a captain is to his crew, how would you reason that therefore they are using something in both cases, both ratios, which is the same yet different? Hmm. Like, hmm. they both have a knowledge. Mm -hmm. Say, would you agree, if you're familiar with this issue, that rulers must have some knowledge of their true rulers in order to benefit their subjects? Yes. Oh. Rulers now, have to have knowledge. It, it, now, is it equally true for a captain and his crew? He has to have a certain kind of knowledge which benefits his crew. Yes. Is it the same kind of knowledge? Yep. Similar. No. Similar kind. What, yeah. Uh, it's similar. What do you mean by that? Um, do they know it's similar? Do they know it's similar? Like, could you go to a captain and say, would you mind talking to me about politics since you already have mastered one kind uh, of mastery? Can you now 
since it's similar to the way a ruler relates to his subjects, can you describe that and give us a talk about it, since you're so familiar with the one? I don't think so. I don't think so. It would be a very yeah. fine captain who could do that, and that would well, be captain. Or if he were, he'd be wasting his time, time. being a captain. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh. Are you are, are you saying that uh, the simula describes uh, that it's two different dimensions? Uh, that's hmm. a good. That's where we're going. Okay. Hmm. But to make that point, would you agree that neither of them have the kind of knowledge which we are assuming is the same in both cases? That's right. So if we had our captain and ruler sitting in these chairs, uh, could we ask either of them, can you talk about the knowledge which is necessary mm. for your art to function? Can you talk about how that's similar to the ruler and his knowledge? You're mm. saying rare. Well, especially from the lower to the higher. From the higher to the lower, it seems like it might be more possible. But someone like the philosopher might be best at uh, describing the similarity in all those. But because he might describe the similarities, would that mean he could qualify as a captain of a vessel? No. Oh, then... <laughs> <laughs> then what does that mean? It means that they can perhaps talk about what is similar but neither of them have it. Right. Neither of them have the similar knowledge. Right. The similar knowledge will not give them... The, the similar knowledge doesn't well, give them the, the either option of functioning on that level in the other ratio. Right. right? Or either. Or either. Either, either way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, wait a minute. Then... Uh, <coughs> If these two people are ignorant about that very thing, do you think they could find a proof that would demonstrate that kind of knowledge independent of themselves? I have no idea. What a charming question, though. Hmm. Independent of themselves, a demonstration yeah. of that kind of knowledge. Hmm. The knowledge that's the same in both of them, if there is such a thing? Well, no, it has to be similar, not the same. Okay. Or every captain of a ship could equally be a ruler of people, and a ruler of people could be equally a captain without changing anything and what it is he knows to manage himself and the art that he possesses. Like switch them in the analogy in their, in their like positions? No. So what do you think of the fact that people like us, I mean, it may be that none of us are captains, or rulers, but we can now talk about what it is that must be similar in those two cases. Hmm. It's a claim that we can see some sameness or identity of an idea or some would, identity. Yeah, we'd have to establish ideas. that identity. Yes. Well, we could go to the nature of an art, couldn't we, in describing fundamental similarities? Yes. Right. We, we, we reach yes. for a model outside of them. Yes. Right. So, okay. so you're going outside of the knowledge of each of them. Mm -hmm. Right. And bringing in, you're introducing a kind of thinking that doesn't belong in either of them. <laughs> right. But can manifest itself in either of them. Yes. That's the fourth. That's a fourth, right? That's the fourth. Yeah. Why do you think it's the fourth? I was Unless, wondering about that very thing. Well, it seems like, is the fourth the very conditions for those to be? Right? Because you're going outside of... Wow. You're seeking to go outside of the descriptions that you're uh -huh. making in your analogy to find a solution to the as. So right. this is the direction not contained, is it? That's right. Which is, in principle, a direction not contained in the particular direction of the hypothesis right, which, or the dimension of which you are a part. Yeah, that's right. Right, which is what I thought Bradley was saying. Yeah. So therefore, 
analogical say. thinking necessarily presupposes a higher mode of thinking beyond the capabilities of any of the particular metaphors you're using to describe mm -hmm. that kind of art. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> now, why is it important to establish that kind of thinking, independent of both, even though both use it and manifest that kind of knowledge in their respective arts? Hmm. But, well, one reason might be, by trying to understand that, you're going beyond the knowledge of each. Okay. And while it's independent of each, with what little you know about what it is to be a true ruler or a true captain, you can nonetheless discover the principles underlining both, which neither of them know. Right. <laughs> and thereby maybe improve both. Yeah. Couldn't you? Couldn't you? Uh, so when bring out discussions of you, like... Sorry, no, so you're like you're stepping out of the framework within the analogy. And you're now talking about what's behind it or above it, from which you can then understand the two ratios independent of what it is they do and, and as they function. Hmm. Okay. So what? <laughs> what does that do for you? Yeah. I don't know. It like opens the doorway to justice <clears throat> and, and beauty and wisdom and it opens the doorway to these, like, you, if you're going to discuss a, a good ruler or a good captain, you'd have to have some idea almost of justice to bring them together. You know, it, like, it, it really, it raises a whole other level of ideas that are already being played out inside of them, but break, makes them more conscious to your participation. Yeah. Like, does that kind of analogy we're playing with presuppose, therefore, understanding the word master, hmm. mastership? Mm -hmm. Oh. On that basis, then, can you then say, wait a minute, there may be other pairs of ratios similar to those two sets we, we mentioned a short while ago. Um, how about dentist to his patients? How about coach to his athletes? How about a teacher of music to his students? Right, we can now add more and more pairs to this. Mm -hmm. And yet in every case, would you agree there's something unique about each of them? that the others do not share. Yeah. And we're taking, looking at the similarity of that uniqueness in each case and saying that must fit into the idea of mastership. Hmm. That's like wow. A, that's like a partable reality. Right. It's like a partable Lucia. We're looking into all the different uh, manifestations see, of it. Yeah, see, that's why in the Parmenides, Parmenides is going for mastership as the key idea. Mm -hmm. Because if he's a philosopher, presumably he might be saying maybe the philosopher is to his own soul. Mm. Nice. The way a ruler is to his subjects. Or the way a musician is to his students. Hmm. Well, he would certainly hope his students come about and discover a higher degree of harmony. Yes. Oh, and hmm. balance? Mm -hmm. Oh, and order? Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. In their experience? Mm -hmm. Well, now you're taking those qualities which are essential for a music teacher, right? to rely upon having to kind of communicate what is important about harmony and balance and rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. and that, his whole game is to sneak that into while he's teaching them about, like oh, Donnie oh. was showing mm. last night, the musical scale on mm. the piano, you know, mm. and I pointed out the black keys are for black music. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's 
why some piano some pianos are blue. Yeah. yeah. So you can play the blues. Yeah. And I think, I do recall that Yanni <coughs> laughed at that. He did. Thinking of me rather bizarre. That, but is it true? I didn't laugh. <laughs> yeah, but see, uh, then there's no proof. Wait a minute. Is it possible that there's no proof for analogical statements independent of the way in which they function? And if so, then all analogical systems, if you're trying to explore them and use them, you're having to look for an insight into both of them, which is independent of both of them, that allows you to make a jump into the higher hypothesis or the higher way of thinking and bring together that higher principle with all of the differences among all of the scattered metaphors or ratios that are each one different as a carpenter is different from a musician in teaching his students or as a captain is to his crew, etc. Taking all of those differences and they must be present in the idea of membership, mastership, right? Hmm. That should be called a proof. That should be called a proof. That should be called the first hypothesis. Hmm. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> now, let me change it. That should be called the first proposition in our new geometry of the soul. Okay. Briefly stated. <laughs> and Pierre, you're going with soul and not with self. Is that right? I know the reason I did that is I was utterly baffled I was present at a talk last night. Really? Hmm. You were baffled? I'm glad you were. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it was very perplexing. I don't know whether anyone told you about it. but um, I'd love to hear. Well, essentially, it's what is the relationship between the self and the soul? Hmm. Oh, that... Yeah, That's all. Apart from that, there was not, nothing else going on. <laughs> or the soul and brilliant light of being, or the soul and logos. Yeah. <laughs> Those were down below that. Yeah. So waiting to come. Like, and uh, I was talking to a, a uh, I was present during a talk, there was a certain foreign gentleman. Uh, a foreign gentleman, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Who was that? I forget his name at the moment, but uh, he was having a difficulty in understanding the very idea of the soul and the idea of self. Because the discussion was what it basically, uh, what are the elements of the soul? And in the discussion I was present before, there was someone who was holding the notion that you have to put in the self in the idea of the soul. And this foreign gentleman was having difficulty following the reasoning, or he did follow it and knew from very good grounds that he wasn't going to accept such a foolish notion. Yeah, hard to tell what was going on. This is the Nordic gentleman I heard tell of? Nordic? I believe so. Mm. <laughs> so his way of solving the problem was that the idea of self is not even in the particular text that we were exploring. Yeah. And therefore, the whole issue was uh, secondary and irrelevant. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't understand Zeno's argument that if it can't be the same, then it must be something else, mm -hmm. which is yeah. leads to the other alternative, which is self. Yeah. If it can't be many, then it must be one. If it can't yeah. be the same, then so that was clever, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what did you think of that sticking the, the self in there? Well, if you could explain the relationship between self and soul and watcher and that which watches, yeah. that would be helpful. Yeah. Because yeah. experiencing both at times. Yeah, if he's pushing that kind of idea and someone else says, well, there's fundamentally a flaw in that kind of thinking because the very idea of self is not in the particular text that they were reasoning, then that person might be having a difficulty going to a higher dimension. 
Yep. There might be something at stake there. Well, we'd want to know what's at stake. Like, what's he holding on to, you know, that's... Well, that's the very point. What's the attachment here. Why don't you set the question before these people and say, can you create some kind of an explanation that might explain this gentleman's difficulty in understanding what was going on? Hmm. Do you know anyone who was present last night? A few people, yeah. Well, who would you and ask? I did leave at the end. I had the urge to get home because I knew my kids needed me. I was like, well, oh, it's 11.30, I need to get home. So uh, I would probably turn to my astute uh, friend who was actually nearby and trying to oh, persuade him this oh, issue, David. Oh. And <laughs> David was there addressing our Nordic friend and also trying to help have them see the point which you were just which he just made, which is it can't be same, so it must be self. Uh, so how would you express this difficulty that he was going through, David? Um, I think it's cultural. The Nordic, they have no problem. <laughs> 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 so anybody from north of Belgium is stuck. <laughs> and maybe even those from Belgium, now that I think of it. <laughs> Because what is one of the assumptions that they make? One of the assumptions they make is that um, the way um, the Greek is dealt with uh, is fixed. And that it can't be subject to uh, examination in terms of contextual usage, the language, rather than going with established meanings. I so think. like a rigorous tra translation? Uh, Basically, a rigorous you look trend. in the book and you see out to anything same. No. Uh, yeah, that would be, if that was the way it was, I mean, yes, a rigorous translation is looking at the book and seeing same. This uh, is the Nordic problem. Yes. And what's been suggested lately is that if you look in the book, then it will inform what same is. Or if you look in the tradition, mm -hmm. in this case, it might inform what that word autos means. <laughs> rather than establishing uh, a definition. Yeah, so that's how you uh, part of that discussion was similar to what we were doing a short few minutes ago. Uh, what does the idea of same include? Mm -hmm. In one sense, it's coincide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things which coincide with one another are equal. Huh? And that's the very problem of one four. You have to exist in the self in one four. Oh, sorry, that was a big leap. <laughs> so if so, if it look here, what is it possible that it takes a certain jump in thinking to look at that passage and say uh, the self fits in there? And a number of people might have difficulty in allowing their mind to go into that higher dimension to grasp some principle that we can use to make sense of the passage. Is, is that possible? Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you happen to know this guy? Brad Bradazovsky? Yeah. Yeah. Bradley over here? I, I have uh, some acquaintance with him. I don't know if I know him yet, but uh, I have some acquaintance with him yeah, for sure. See, what did you see that our friend and our, the gentleman in question, what difficulty did he have? Now, I'll, I'll tell you something, quickly. I happen to have known that there was a strange woman that was present there. Yeah? Who's that? Yeah, I forget her name. Which but, one of many? Uh, Barbara. Is that the one you live with? Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she said that she was watching him go in and out of accepting that idea. Mm -hmm. yeah, he did. He said, oh, I see what you're doing. And then he jumped out. Like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, how do you... Like, and, the, and the particular gentleman in question has a very fine knowledge of the language. I have spent many hours considering all of these ideas. And a desire to represent the words for what they say and the way they are in the book to take yeah. them through. <laughs> to be taught how 
how to reason like the way he's been taught how to read by you. Read by you. <laughs> With the vehemence. It really makes me wonder about the state man that he was going in and defending that. That's what I like to understand. You know, like that state had a lot of, he did have, it was very animated. Yep. And it gave him a lot of power. And I still got all straight chested. And, you know, boy, boy, oh yeah. He did have a certain joy about him. Yeah. He did have a jubilance. Actually, I saw the reverse. I saw when he came to a conclusion, he was high. And for that moment, when he hit himself, when he attacked himself, or attacked the argument, uh, I saw it as a counterattack. Uh, he diminished. It appeared like he was puffed up, but really he was diminished because he was actually much clearer when he concluded. So, now, to what degree does he represent a culture? Like he was, he has been taught uh, a certain way of thinking, and he's using it and he's defending it. Is it possible that other people may have gone through the same problem and got out of it, Barbara? Yeah. No. What does it take? Uh, what does it take uh, you? Even though I think you often put this description on me, I really don't think it fits me very well. Okay. Um, I'm not a classically educated person. I didn't. I took Greek one year and a couple of classes, and that's not the what Ingmar has, nor what David has. They are the ones who have the uh, deep knowledge of Greek and grammar and practice and all of that. That isn't me. So, now, apart from, but apart from that, you can appreciate going from the one to the other. Going from, from let us say, oh, okay. I mean, I, I, I agree that. I, I had to go from looking at it, strictly speaking, in terms of the Smythe Grammar book and looking at it in terms of, um, that was, I was struggling with that the moment ago. What is that? Looking at it in terms of reason? I think there is, there was a, I did go through that transition. Yeah. Not easy transition. See, I'm interested in that movement. that psychically you made. Because I suspect that that kind of motion, motion or movement uh, is something that the gentleman that we were talking about has a difficulty in making. Oh yeah, I, I think so. I do wonder though if there's not something else at stake. I mean something else, some other pathologos drama that he's playing out. But yeah, I think that's that's quite right. But what if the people who hold his view also have pathologos dramas that preclude them, make it difficult for them to make the passage from the one to the other? Okay, I think that would be likely. I think there would be people who would be led to a conclusion that in fact self might be a better word or same does not fit. One might lead to the other. And, and yeah, they would snap back into, but the grammar says. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Like, I think they'd have a similar drama. Yeah, like did it, when you were doing Greek with that professor yeah. whose name escapes me for the moment. Kolakidis, or no. you mean like Lucy? Berkowitz, my yeah. I never had, yeah. thank God. What would she have done with that passage uh, that we used last night? Completely dismissed it as um, set in stone, this is the way you translate. It's either an it or a same. See. Um, the, the notion that there was any other dimension in which to reflect on Greek was, was not a part of their work. See, what's curious about this kind of reasoning then, it looks like uh, the Greek world made that transition as a cultural group. If we have trouble, even even in understanding the block, they understood it and went beyond it. 
Now that's... Hmm. You mean they as the whole culture, or yeah. just Plato? Yeah. It's like if we had, if we could visit ancient Greeks and give pass around that passage and say to them, we're only interested in the number of people who you, pardon me, we're only interested in those people among you that know English and then a certain group which go forward and would say, can you translate that passage in English? Then we would like to know what percentage would come out with the idea, one idea or one way of doing it and the other another. Hmm. It might be 50-50. But you see, that's an immense difference. Yeah, that there are any in the category of self would be. Mm -hmm. yeah. A common community that gathers together whenever there's an opportunity to, to do that is pretty rare. I think since 400 BC, there's only been one other one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, the, the, the thought comes to mind in, in Thirsus Barriers are, are many, inspired mystics are few. Uh, it, that may have been a problem in that culture too. Yeah. Because you know, they did, they did screw the guy over in the end. Um, there was a, a lot of injustice and, and hubris and, and things that really caused disaster. Um, so yeah, um, mm. but if there is any part of that culture which is capable of doing that, that would be unique. Yeah. So See, the argument is because and I think given the reasoning there might the percentage might go up right given the reason that you took us through reasoning that you took us through last night the, the percentage would would go up I think you know they'd follow the reasoning and could let go of their inclination I think the, the same and other as a pair would lead them in one direction and that's what I mean by 50 percent mm -hmm. they'd see those two as being uh, contrary or yeah. So, yeah. Hmm. Or. I don't know what the cor correct term is. I, I okay. really should learn it. Yeah. Same and other are contrary? Opposites? Okay. Yeah, see, because what's, what's hanging in the balance is why some people can say that that Greek era had a golden age and others refuse to even, even acknowledge the idea of a golden age really? among Europeans. Hmm. Though I sometimes I have difficulty calling Greeks Europeans. <laughs> For good reason. <laughs> Indo-Europeans. <laughs> North Africans. <laughs> Egyptians. And Hellenics. Yeah. Yeah. Like, this morning I... Uh, I was looking at some videos on the web of uh, the ISIS group uh, beheading a number of people and stoning to death women. And, uh, you know, can we understand that movement? in terms of what we're talking about. Hmm. Are there people who have a stake in not, in not seeing and are willing to kill off anyone who breaking their rule that thou shalt not think on this higher <coughs> level? Yeah. Like is the human race in the middle of a war against itself among different classes of people? Yes. Hmm. And if you put, if you drop self in there, yeah, mm. what are we doing? You're waking up, right? You're are waking we, up to the. Uh, how could you kill another person? But, right, if you got, uh, if you're dealing, you mean with without s stoning them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beheading them. Like this video I was watching, some woman videotaped secretly what it was like in an Islamic state run by the ISIS group. And absolutely, all the women were absolutely covered except for that 
little light. And uh, they were, uh, she was able to film uh, these ISIS fighters going in into a store and demanding that certain objects be covered and in some cases not sold at all. I mean, it's really a return to a, uh, a lower dimension. And the higher presupposes a certain kind of freedom and integrity and sense of beauty. Because in that whole thing, there was this woman who made this statement that she was able to record. And it was, uh, Women like to women like to, to be able to show themselves. Mm -hmm. That's simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a risky right? proposition in that <clears throat> And then there's a whole bunch of <clears throat> guys in the background with hatchets ready. Yeah. <laughs> to chop the head off of those people who are gonna hold that view. Unfortunately they're doing it to children too. I said, unfortunately, they're doing it to children, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, the children of the in, object. In, in, in Africa, the, the one of the biggest tools is rape. One, because it, it, it puts a woman in a, in a, in a, in a role that uh, they're no longer accepted by their own village and their culture. It's a shaming that can't be. But the other thing is that they're killing all the young men and raping the girls 10 above, tying them down, raping them to death. Um, and it's it's a genocide, really. But the Hutus and the Tutsis um. were fighting. They don't fight anymore. The whole thing has been swept under the carpet. But now the Hutus are uh, uh, emerging as key ISIS fighters. So there's, I think there's ideologies there um, that need to be investigated. Why were the Tutsis? Why are you know these two president and vice president in two different tribes and I forget what country I read it's in Time magazine. They're fighting, and so their warriors are killing off each other. Uh, the vice president's warriors are mostly raping and pillaging, killing. Um, <clears throat> but there has to be some ideology behind it, that, because they're all, they're just they're all dirt poor and trying to make a living. There must be something other than just name of a, a family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and are we like? Whatever is going on today, isn't that the same thing that took place that brought about the Dark Ages with mm. Christianity? I'm sure. I'm sure there was like right? the Stonian destruction of libraries, kind of bridges, yeah. destruction of Rome, taking apart the aqueduct system, destruction of anything intellectual, burning down this and that. Well, like that comment we were talking earlier by Ted Cruz that if women want to avoid being raped, they should not go to any party where there was alcohol, right? Which is kind of like covering yourself up, you know? You can't can't go to a party, that's how you avoid rape? Oh, we'll just stay home then, right? But that's, no that's, that's the beginning of that whole that's, thing. That's the beginning that's of that I, whole thing. Yeah, that's why I was bringing it up. Yeah. Right. We're not gonna try and account for that rape. Whole movement. We're just gonna blame it yeah. on the victim. Right, we're not gonna. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is a twisted, but could become a moral code that we don't examine what rape is. We just examine the victims and say they're they're at fault. That could be a whole new way of thinking about women. That's an old way of thinking about women. They're the temptress. They're the ones that are engaging themselves, and they are responsible oh, that's true. for. That's, that's true. So women should not. So he's doing the same thing. They're under cruise. Women are going to be required to wear a little dark and and just be. Because they Turn are, legs and long sleeves they, and they invite boring. violence by showing themselves. Yeah. So we must keep them quiet, uh, covered up. Yeah. See, what's interesting is that culture, the Islamic culture, was able to develop what they even called the second Plato and Al Farabi. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Where's that coming from? And, well, that came out of Islamic Spain. Okay. Mm. In the ninth, seventh, ninth, eleventh century, twelfth century. And uh, uh, one of the great one of the great works on understanding the origin of nationalism 
is uh, uh, the Makwadima. The Makwadima. Aquadima, yeah. And that's that's what woke up Europe to nationalism. It came out of it was on the Algebra. A good part of the one of the positive changes in European history called the Renaissance started out of Spain, Islamic Spain. I mean that's why they created the universities in opposition to the new kind of learning coming into university, uh, pardon me, into Europe. Hmm. That was the primary hmm. origin of European system, of the university. Did they were threatened by it, just like presently Islamic thought and the extreme conservatism is threatened by liberal thinking. Catholics were stressed out, at that time, if you were caught with the translation of the New Testament, you're put to death on the spot. No learning, no, nothing. So like, what are we seeing? In our Return own culture, a fundamentalism, whether it, wherever it, whatever it takes. And you know what? You know what we're doing? Thank you. We're, begin we're beginning to start with a dangerous thesis. Thank you. What happens if education includes the primary role of analogies in thinking? Can you say that again, Pierre, please? I, I was getting coffee. If analogy Go ahead. is implemented into thinking, just analogies. <clears throat> what would happen to a culture that introduces analogies in the fifth grade? Your, fo your focus is then on the intelligible. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. It'd be, it'd be a revolution to the yeah. education system. Right. Cultivating mind and reason. Because it's stepping outside of that dimension into that yeah. dimension. How 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 clear? I mean, it's fundamental to Plato huh? analogy. No. That kind of thinking is the one of the key foundations. It's not. I don't. It's what he talks about in Timaeus, um, and then he uses it throughout. And allegory and, yeah. and well, but you got it. That's a kind of that's a way of learning and and, and that's a kind of knowledge based on analogy. Yeah. A system of knowledge. There goes theology. Or jo dogmatic theology. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And I think it also introduces the idea of the level of mystics. Pardon me? That mystics, why introduce it? That you, if you can exp work with analogies, then be able to move from one ratio to the next and bring it together and talk about it. You're moving to a different level, and in that way, I, I'm seeing it as uh, a much high, a higher level of, of reflecting. And in the process itself, just working out an analogy brings that kind of experience. You said there goes a kind of theology, and Josh walked in, who's doing another kind of theology. So I thought I might ask him. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of theology am I doing? The theology of uh, the process of theology of Plato. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, done a lot of studies into that. How, how, do, are, how are you finding the... the, the Different use of analogy. I don't know if he literally does analogies like the way we've talked about them, but he does seem to... He does have these levels of progression and reversion in them, mm -hmm. which seem to, in some sense, involve analogy, but not necessarily explicitly. 
through the through the idea of life. Yeah, primarily. yeah, and I believe, and this is my my lack of Greek understanding. I believe he says it's done through Sia. At least Taylor says uh, essence, subsistence. Like, what is this word that they use? Uh, substance. Substance. He, he uses essence for Usia. He does. Oh. Okay, so uh, all progression proceeds through likeness, and all regression proceeds through likeness. Mm -hmm. And it's likeness of Usia. If you get back to the idea of the producing cause. And every producing cause is superior to that which it produces. And everything, every superior cause contains that which it produces in a more superior manner. But the thing which it produces, like what does it mean that it produces something else? It gives it its subsistence. It gives it its, its essence. So in some sense it, it did give like a new sea through there. And then when it tries to revert, it reverts back through that essence to what was the source of its goodness. You're talking elements of theology, yeah. theology right? Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. And I, I see something like analogical in there, but he doesn't make it explicit. Like, Well, isn't a, a proof like all of the propositions that presuppose one for? Uh -huh. That is an analogical statement. One for isn't it? I don't know. The As the proofs are in Euclid to the... And any which? proof in, in Euclid that presupposes for as one of its essential basis for concluding is, in, is making an analogical statement. Just as mm -hmm. two triangles can be said to coincide and become therefore the basis of a rational solution, so at this case, we must assert the same principle at this point in order to make the conclusion necessary for the proposition we are working on. In propolis, yeah, right? Well, that's saying proof, citing one for is itself, finish it. Using analogy or citing yeah. analogy? In because you, as a thinker, you have to say, if I'm following 112, and that depends on 14, I have to then make the connection back to it and assume as if I can use it. It's an analogical statement. I'm assuming some identity between yeah. these two ideas. some coincidence <laughs> of, the, of the two ideas. I do find it curious in the elements of theology that it seems like Proclus is using all of these ideas of self and usia, and he never actually <laughs> explains like what usia is. Like it's almost like it is already. An, <laughs> Like a common <coughs> <Like an emission. coughs> <Like an emission. coughs> is a higher dimension. Than theology? Everywhere it's being used. It's the introduction of a higher principle to make sense of a lower. Anagogic. Like the highest principle. <coughs> the highest. <coughs> yeah. Is that true now? When do you need it? When do you need Usia? When do you need the idea of Usia? To talk about... Give me a sentence that you might use it. When I might, do, when I might use Usia? Yeah, yeah. Ooh, uh... When discussing fundamentally its power of turning oneself back, back upon the self. Or, See, I would use it actually as returning one to the good. Yeah, just the first part you just said. What was it again? Turning back upon its self, completely. Like I would say, that I would describe a sea in that. See, <clears throat> in principle, that is impossible in three dimensions. Completely, abundantly so. <laughs> right. Yeah, and absurd to even consider <laughs> from three dimensions. So that's a. 
That's a fourth dimensional concept in a three dimensional rational structure. And you made a major point. You said the, the, the lack, the lack of proof for the existence of Usia is central to the to Proclus, and he doesn't give it. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's like he skirts around it, you know, and like but takes see, a little bit. And wants. See, the second hypothesis he introduces it as a given. I, I yes, yes. There is no discussion of it. No. That's right. Some That's because or? there's a gap between each hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And that gap is. Inconceivable, unpredictable, ir non rational, <clears throat> but has to be made by the thinker, by the individual. Uh huh. <laughs> like, like, what the, you know, like, suppose you're in a rational group and they haven't heard of Proclus and you've been asked to give a description of the second hypothesis, but one participates in Usia. <laughs> All right? That's your task. Go ahead. How would you do it? Now you can call on help if you want. You know, you got Eldars right there. Well, somehow he talks about the <clears throat> one, and then he talks about something which is not one, but has, becomes one by participating in Usia. In Usia. And it's now, this how thing would you which explain? is not one, so therefore it no, it's no, a no. one with otherness. Like no. You're uh, going to explain how you might introduce that idea to people who are, relatively speaking, rational and they're interested in understanding what you mean by the second hypothesis. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd start with, first of all, a clear idea of what one is. That's it's, right. I'd Wait a minute. That's right. Is, that's like, right. And that, you know, it's in one sense not many, because that's the first proposition, right? Like, so... But then you have to somehow introduce the idea of something which is other than the one that's not one. And that's a, that, that, that to me look, is like look, a look, black look. hole of like, how do you, what was it if it wasn't a one? Look, I, I got it. Look here. It's a one with character. I think we need a judge. All right? Uh -huh. Regina, you're going to be the judge. He's going to give a talk now how we would present the second hypothesis to a group who haven't yet heard about it, though there's a certain level of rationality among them. You'll judge whether or not he's offering a sound explanation to this group. Okay, are you ready? And I can okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, if among you other judges. establish what I've tried so far. <laughs> yeah. Uh. What do you think of what I've tried so far? No, you're starting. This is oh, a new yeah. group. He's starting. Again? So we are clear on what the one is? Or an idea of the one? I thought that's what you said you needed to start out with. Yes. Right. So can, I, can we agree to that? Take that as a one up. All right. Sweet. So he talks about the one. What is the proposition exactly? It participates. And Lucia. The one that participates of Lucia, but isn't there more? To what this? one, if it is, participates of Lucia? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm you're supposed to be a judge now. <laughs> yeah. well, you're I helping, don't. you're helping judge. <laughs> you're going to be disqualified <laughs> if you do that again, you know. We have a different know. view of judges now. All right, I'm just Number warning three. you. What is the proposition statement? Because I know three is everything I just that gave participate, it to you. the one is not the one. <laughs> I just I mean, gave it to however you. However you're going to do it, oh, okay. how would you do it? I don't know. I mean, I'm a little stuck. I just gave it Look, to you. You don't have to be stuck. Call on out. Wait, wait, what was it? That's the hypothesis. Can one, one, one be and not participate of Lucia? It's almost a negative, isn't it? One, if it is, participates of Lucia. That's a statement of the I second. Think, no, in the, is this the theology I'm talking about or the Parmenides? However you do it. Yeah. Well, they're different. Well, right? I, we don't care. You're going to do it. I don't know which one to prove, though. The one, like the second <laughs> hypothesis from the Parmenides, or I think I think you should start by saying, <clears throat> guys, this is going to sound crazy, <laughs> but 
<laughs> okay, we'll leave. So, so go yeah, that way. For the one to be, do you need a system outside of one, and therefore you need another. You need a, another dimension in order for one to be. Oh, he could. He, he's going to offer an explanation. Okay. Go ahead, try it. Well, that's all I got, really. <clears throat> no, no, that's okay. Go ahead. If you <clears throat> have one, then there can be no other. Mm -hmm. So if you want one to be, it can't be as a result of it being one. So you must get outside of one in order for there to be a one. So you need another mm -hmm. system of thinking. How could one be one unless it recognized its own identity. So it has to be able to reflect back on itself. Thus it has to have a seal. Is this the way you would explain it to a group of people who... I can barely explain it to this group. <laughs> <laughs> because you are offering an explanation. Yeah. How effective do you think that would be among this group of people who are rational but well, have my, not... At my nephew's wedding. <laughs> a bunch of Irish Catholics who don't know how to speak. <clears throat> it would definitely have an effect. They'd give you a drink, but aside from that... Yes, it's big. I, I, I thought it was a... One to, uh, I'm going to have to conceal my... Uh, interest... Of, I thought it was a good statement. See, with this discussion actually. started with your point that you found it curious that there's no explanation for Osea in, in Proclus. Oh, I see. And you cited the elements of theology. Right. So then I suggested, well, what would it be like if you were before a group of people who are rational, who didn't have an understanding of this curious word? Uh -huh. And could you then ex use this idea of Usia in terms of the second hypothesis? That's the second part. Uh -huh. You might say, I'll just deal with the first part and forget about the participation in Usia for a while. I'll just talk about Usia to this group. Uh -huh. How would you do it? I think I'd have to start with the idea of <clears throat> ooh, Usia. Where would I start with it? It's twofold. One would be itself as a state and what it was like to be in that state. Mm -hmm. And that state of mind that's involving participation of the self. And then the second would be I try to explain its dynamic quality. It's this, that's it's you're the quality of giving us, function. You're giving us the reason why you'd say whatever it is you're going to say yeah, to the group yet, without telling us what you're going to be saying well, to the group. Well, you know, I'm to, I make bullet points first, and then, <laughs> and then I explain the bullet points. I have an outline in my mind, <clears> at least, now look, filling in the outline. Uh, look, let me help, sir. Oh, please. <clears throat> say, Jan, how are you? Oh, oh. Do you ever visit Utah? Really? Uh, you known in Utah? Yes. Well, what if you were invited there by a group of p people you're familiar with, and they came across this curious word, Usia, and they asked you to explain what it meant? How would you do it? I would. I, would. I don't. They don't. Come on. I don't. <laughs> what might you say? Um. Okay, well, I don't, I, I mean, first I would, I don't, if that's my answer, I don't think I could do it, but if, if I, if, what I, I would probably, if I had to uh, give some sort of explanation, I'd probably think something like, um, getting to know, well, pra something like practicing, like practicing a musical instrument, because, um, hmm. I remember when I first was learning guitar, it, it was very, very difficult to play simple chords. But then, after practicing sufficiently, it becomes second nature when you don't think about it. And I would u try, use that as an example, but the truth is I don't really know what we see it is. So, uh, that I, transition from practice to spontaneity you'd use is turning about a and turning about as an Usia movement. Yeah. So, I think I would take them through that's the a, first right, that's a, that's a very nice way of presenting, is it not? I think it's a doorway into the state of mind of it and the yeah. experience, yes. <clears throat> if, if, 
if you had, can get somebody to recall such an yeah. experience. <clears throat> uh, could you say, and if you have an interest in now that you can do this spontaneously, do you know there are other kinds of chords that have a, that are the same yet different? Oh well, yeah, you could do that, yes. You and then say, by the way, if you become just as spontaneously familiar with these others as you have with this one way we just used, you may discover something called harmony. Is that a... That's another... Oh! Would you sneak in and when you're catching on to harmony you may get close to beauty? I would definitely, yeah, I would definitely that. Mm. Better, Bob. Mm. Could you also say there's also an order among the particular chords? Yeah, huh? I, would, I would say that. Oh, mm -hmm. so you draw them into the fact that behind these sounds is an order? <laughs> oh, yeah. Independent of the notes? That's exactly what I do. My good heavens, <laughs> might that astonish a couple of them? Yeah, it would. And it, yes, and oh. uh, might you then uh, take one of your own compositions and play it and ask them what it's doing to them? I would first compose something that does what you just said and then I would do that again. Ah. <clears throat> would you invite them then to be participating in something? Ooh, I use that word. And if they can go along with that, what might you say? Ah. Once you got that little in, <laughs> could you then uh, go further? I, I hell yes, I well, think I would. Yeah. You could say, now I'd like to know why you're here. Like, what brought you to sit down to explore this idea? Like, you people must be unusual. A lot of people wouldn't, didn't, just you. Yeah. What might you tell them? Um, that, they're, that they're into Usi. Yeah. Would you be willing to say curiosity is an invariable quality of Usi? Huh? Yes. Ah, oh, surprise? Yes. Ah, uh, insight? Yeah. Ah, higher dimensional thinking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stick it right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. Uh, Did you go along with this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you two I'm ever... writing it all down. <laughs> <laughs> going to bumps. Yeah. And now when you got that laid down, right? You might say, you got a cell? <laughs> like, what's doing. what's doing all of this? Mm -hmm. To sneak in the idea of self? So. And make sure the back door is open? Yeah. <laughs> 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 we put a dinner to our Nordic friend last night. <laughs> <laughs> He's been coming here for 20 years. That's awesome. Uh, I was I was thinking, it's not actually something that you can uh, explain to somebody or give a speech about. Like you have to experience it on some level um, in order to go further. Like um, like you were saying with Yani, uh, when they when they when they're actually participating in that state. Then you can ask, what's that? Because uh, I was, I was like trying to think back how I, how I was getting into this, and um, I had to actually have some kind of insight for me to realize that there might be another dimension uh, or something higher that mm -hmm. that can make sense of all the mm -hmm. all the lower. So it's like, you have to actually, it has to be personal. You, you, you can't get it from a, 
from a presentation or sure. from a speech. So once a person gains that personal familiar, familiarity, then that be, could be the condition for raising their reflection above their present status to more complex and more beautiful perceptions of Usaya, right? Right. Because then they, it opens up a whole new playing field. Yeah, like what if Yanni were to say, uh, you know, we've had enough fun with this idea of Usia. By the way, what would it be like to know the self? What, what effect might that have on this noble group that you're talking about? Would it inspire them? It should, Is right? Excited? Yeah. Oh. Is that likely? Yeah. But they, they, but they may be one in the audience who says, how the hell do you do that? Then what would you tell them? Get out of here. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> you could say you're doing it. Right? Of course, you have to watch out. They may accuse you of all kinds of things like um, rhetoric. Okay, heresy. Yeah, Devil. Devil. Yeah, mm. I do this. It reminds me now that you gave him this example. I was, I'm sorry, I didn't give you my best self in that moment. That's for sure. But Brad knows I tutor this one boy in mathematics. I tutor him in geometry, in fact. And we do all the the math work together. And then we almost always have five, ten minutes left. And I bring him into other discussions about geometry. And the first thing I started him on was the first construction or the first proposition of Euclid. I said, well, let's look at what we're really trying to do here. And you know, they give you a finite straight line and you have to construct an equilateral triangle from that. And there's a moment when everybody I've ever brought this through, when they see it, and I always <coughs> ask them, like, what was that like? Mm -hmm. What was that like? Tell me about that. And this boy, <laughs> he's an eighth grader, he's like, that's the happiest I've ever been. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Huh? He said wow. that. He was like, right? this is the happiest I've ever been. Woo. <laughs> I'd watch that kid from well, that yeah. point on. Oh, I've told him. I completely, I go, well, now I know you have a mind. I know you have the ability to see. So I know you think very well. And I always, like, I'm pushing him further. And, further <laughs> that. and so, because there's always a moment of insight. Like, everybody sees that proposition eventually like oh and some it comes like at the very end and some it comes pretty early but right when you see it you ask them what it was like and that's like asking them about their participation in it and giving them an experience like you said as a doorway and so and then that opens up a lot opens up a big discussion because you ask them what is it that brought it all together and and you know you could ask them about a whole without parts because yeah. in one moment they see the whole thing Without parts. But that's separate from the parts, or they see yeah. it come together beyond all the parts. And so it has all of those same ideas of harmony mm -hmm. and... Analogy. Analogy, yeah. Well, that's it's, jump, it's, helped him jump that, make it that jump. I also asked him what it was like before that. He said, terrible. <laughs> He's like, hey, I <laughs> <laughs> But I brought him to see that yeah. he couldn't have had the insight without that portion. Yeah. So almost to accept them like the yin and the yang. How yin long ago was this? Oh, uh, what? Four weeks ago? Oh. Five weeks ago? I was hoping it was four years ago. No, he's, he's still tutoring. He's because still then we could say, what has he been doing? See? Well, we'll see. I'm, I'm proud of him. I'm I would be. Him, yes, like, yes. And so I take him to other discussions. I did bring him to study the idea of similar triangles and how the idea of similar triangles is really kind of like model copy and how we see the sameness of relation of the sides, but we mm -hmm. see difference in mm -hmm. terms of their mm -hmm. actual existence. And then I said, I have this teacher, his name's Pierre Grimes, and he's like a model to me, but I don't, I'm not going to say what Pierre says. I'm not going to do what Pierre does because that's, that's his expression. But the way I relate to the ideas can be a similar way. And then he said he wanted to be an uh, engineer and work at NASA. And I was like, so, who are the people who you're going to look to? Who are the people who are the top of your, who are the top of what you want to get into? How did they get there? What do they think like, that, like, what are the questions that they have? Have you thought about that? He was like, whoo! <laughs> <laughs> what, what makes them happy? <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> and then he gives me his 50 bucks and walks out the door. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Greedy. So, yeah. Say, in your field of mathematics, how, does, how do you, how, how do you uh, explain how you get a straight line? <laughs> Point sliding lying evenly on itself. <laughs> uh, no, how do you see, explain I, how you get it? No, oh, you, you mean like from taking points, a, taking a point and pulling it through a dimension? Line. Yeah. Well, what's in between? Infinity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is literal. There's literal descriptions. You take a point and they describe it like pulling it through itself. But um, what are you adding other than points when you're talking about a line between two points? Space? As I no, mentioned. No, no. What is a line? A line is breathless length, according to Euclid, but... Hmm. See, that's how you discover it. I asked you what it is. What it is. How do I, what's the question? How do I explain it? Say so you have, to, you tell your class, hey, I got two points. Uh -huh. Now I got to make a line. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure what I mean by line. <laughs> <laughs> like, would you ask the kids, can you come up with an idea of a line? Because I need it between these two points. Uh -huh. Well, you get from here to there in point land. Oh, sorry. No, I've just... Uh, well, How would you do it, Barbara? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I have one approach, which is, I mean, the definition is breathless length. And that's kind of hard to... You, I explain that you can't see no, that. See, that describes, that describes something that you already have found. Mm -hmm. Okay. How you describe it if they haven't found it? Yeah. I say, can you imagine a point here, and can you imagine a point here? Yeah. Now what? And then can you can you cause can you see what connects them? That's a lie. What is the thing that connects the two points? Would you mind telling me? What is that thing other than calling it a line? Hmm. I don't know. Mm. I don't is there know. some kind of continuity? I don't know. Or sameness? See, because it seems like I want to use the word same with respect to a line. And I can't figure out why. Yeah, I'm looking at it going, why? Go ahead. I think See, the movement, you have to assume movement. Mm -hmm. The movement of a point leaves a shadow of its movement behind itself. Really fast, wow. kicks up little dust. Wherever it goes, it leaves in its wake a shadow of itself. Hmm. And I don't like using that language, so I'm hmm. going to conceal it by calling it a line. <laughs> right. What do you do about, oh, you don't necessarily <laughs> right. have to I'm going to conceal that. So <laughs> I don't want to tell the kids this is a shadow of a point. Here. Because, uh, a shadow of a point. It doesn't have well, a have By what shadow. kind of light do you have to have, that to have a point that has a shadow? Yeah. But just in order to avoid that, so call it a line. <laughs> and a point has no shadow. Hmm. But if a line is a breathless length, let's take away what it isn't, which is doesn't have any breath, and talk about the problem of length. Length can only occur outside a point. So a line is how a point gets from one place to another in a new dimension. Now, see, it already assumes, and you have to assume something else exists, yeah. a space within which you can move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Move that which has no point. Well, what the hell is space? Well, you would say, Outside of this, 
Would you mind telling us <laughs> what space park. is and stop fooling around? Yeah, a space. Well, in this example, like, right, you're moving to outside this three dimension, this Any third dimension. Any place but here. Huh? <laughs> Any place but here. Yeah. Right? You... Any place other than here. Yeah. <laughs> right? Another well, dimension. You have to assume yeah. another dimension. Welcome Job to the geometry. Weirdo Group. <laughs> right. You do have to. You have to assume two dimensions. What the hell is a dimension? Well, we'll put that aside. Yeah. Good. Now that we got it, we can now talk about it as if we know what we've just done. <laughs> we've been doing pretty well since the beginning. <laughs> what about the idea of a shortest distance between two points? Isn't that a straight line? No, what did she say? What about the shortest distance between two points and the other straight line? Oh. What do you say, Josh? Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> tell I'm tell not her. against that. I mean, but what is the what do you what do you mean to point out by that? Well, I, I have some students that think a line can be curved and go all over and they call that a line. Sure. But there are other ideas, true. These are, this is the difference between Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry doesn't allow space to bend. Like, it, it's two-dimensional. And so, essentially, the difference is between parallel lines. In Euclidean geometry, parallel lines never touch. But in non-Euclidean geometry, they do have lines which are parallel that do touch one another because they're on curving surfaces in the curving map them run into each other eventually. But I don't understand your idea of like, would I accept that as a definition? The shortest distance between two points is a straight line? Yeah. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that as a definition. I, I wouldn't. That's more a property of a line. Something you can say about it, but not, that doesn't define what it is. It's okay. That's a, that's what a type question? of line. I was gonna say, I, <coughs> I went to a place last weekend and a guy there said that a new dimension comes about when something moves in an unknown direction yeah that's right so that would make sense of your um, point leaving behind a shadow and therefore creating a line yeah, because uh, to assign movement to a point, you're giving it life. It moves to another location. Does it have a will? Uh, how does it like being a straight line? Right? <laughs> I've never heard this in my entire life, and I'm enjoying it. Thank you. Enough. And you do all now, the rather than later. Line. <laughs> <laughs> Final line, dude. Part of it was part move. Part of it was here, part of it was there. Well, I'll tell you. And leave the I remember when I did one for. And? For the first time. It's so upset. In, in Good. what manner? Upset what? That was phony. That the rest was phony? Or that it is The whole study of geometry rests upon a fiction. Uh-huh. Good for us. Yeah. <laughs> I said, what the hell? Wow. I mean, if you're going to look for something that's rational, you ain't going to find it in geometry or mathematics. It's amazing. Yeah, so I told my instructor that uh, why don't you deal with the implications of this notoriously poor argument? <laughs> I'm sure it's not go that. very far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Word got around. But I remember that day very well. You're right, and too much is wrong. <coughs>
very, very peculiar, like, like whatever follows. It's a fiction. Not that it might not be clever to do this and that, but you ain't going to call it knowledge. Hmm. Huh? So was the... And that means understanding is fundamentally flawed. Therefore, there has to be a gap between understanding and knowledge. Hmm. Whatever the hell knowledge. But there may be a flaw in that. Indeed. Now that didn't occur to me at the same day. But yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fun, Thank you. Fun, wow. fun, fun. Yeah. Say, hey, Pierre, are you? Uh, I hate to ask this question because you never know the answer to it. Good. But I'll try one more time. Uh, are you going to be in town tomorrow, and would you like to join us reading the Parmenides? I have a very good idea that I'll be in town tomorrow. Uh, are, okay. you, are, you, are you up to yeah. uh, talk tomorrow yeah. morning? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. The word will be the word will be sent forth in yes, every right. language common to man. Good. Well, I usually send it to the Parmenides group. <laughs> oh, okay. Because most of the I usually send the, the notice of the Parmenides meeting to the Parmenides people. And if anybody says, I want to know, then I put them on the list. Yeah. But other than that, I don't send it out mm -hmm. to the group at large. So. I Thank you. Thank you. Have hey, a question. Pierre, thank you. Thank Pierre. You. Pierre. Fun. Double. Double. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Good, good. So. Should I ask you how you're doing? No, don't ask okay. me how I'm doing. Okay, I won't. <laughs> I think he did. Serious people. Yeah. You know, aren't they?